How's it going, folks? My name is Eric. I'm a wedding filmmaker based out of Chicago. This is my home. It looks cool because my wife's an interior designer, not because of me. While I wholeheartedly... <laughs> nice transition. <laughs> While I wholeheartedly believe that story is the most important thing when it comes to wedding filmmaking, and that gear doesn't matter, and that sentiment being the most important thing in the process of making wedding films, I also think that foundational skills and first steps are incredibly important as well. Without further ado, let me just share my first six steps of how to start becoming a wedding filmmaker. First and foremost, you need a camera. The topic that everybody loves talking about, the thing that I get asked most in DMs on Instagram, what camera should I use? And when it comes to wedding filmmaking, I think there are two things that are really important. One being that the camera has some sort of autofocus and reliable autofocus. And second, that it can shoot in 24 frames per second and 60 frames per second for a cinematic look and being able to shoot in slow motion. Wherever you're coming from is different because all of you are diff different people. <laughs> you gotta figure out if a camera that you already have might be able to do the job or if you need to upgrade to something else. I can assume that a lot of people who are watching this are photographers who are looking to getting into wedding filmmaking and so you might already have a mirrorless camera body or a DSLR that can do video. So do your research and see if that camera can do autofocus and if it can shoot in slow motion at 60 frames per second as well as 24 frames per second. Some really popular cameras uh, to start off on are the 5D Mark IV uh, are a great way to, to get started in the video realm. Maybe the, the Sony a7 III, a7S II, a7S III if you want to splurge. The Panasonic GH5 is also a, a really good dedicated video camera for shooting weddings as well. There's a multitude of different options. You have Canon mirrorless like the R or the R6 or R5. Do your research and see what is going to be best for you. And like I said, prioritizing that autofocus and being able to shoot in slow motion can be really helpful in helping you out with first steps. But at the end of the day, like I said, gear doesn't necessarily matter if you just put your heart and soul into crafting a story that makes people cry. So, okay. Number two. One of the most important things I think beginners kind of fail to do and incorporate is the use of audio in your films and having the right tools and gear to be able to capture audio to be able to enhance the story. First is a shotgun mic, uh, a mic that can sit on your camera or on your rig and go straight into camera to capture what's called scratch audio, whether it's people laughing or city noises happening if you're shooting in a city or maybe uh, birds chirping if you're out in the country. Just getting that ambient sound and layering it under maybe music that you put or anything else that's going on in the film to enhance again that story component to, to bring people into the edit, to bring people into what they're viewing. Next. Lavalier microphones. This one is the Rode Smart Lav, and you actually have to put a dongle on the end of it because it goes straight into iPhone. So uh, do your research on this. It's a pretty affordable way to get a lav on somebody. So maybe you put it on a groom, like on their lapel, or you could even get fancy and put it under clothing with gaff tape. So this is an affordable option uh, if you want. It's linked down in the description. All this stuff is linked down in the description. But the most popular thing in the wedding filmmaking world is this Tascam DR10L. And it is its own unit. It has a recording device and a lav mic. And it's over twice the price of the smart lav. But what's amazing about it is that it can record two different levels of audio at the same time. So a track that is hotter, meaning that it's picking up more. So if someone's talking really quietly, it'll be able to capture it. And if someone speaks really loudly, it has a lower track so that if anything clips on that hot track, you can use the lower one and they record simultaneously. So this is an incredible tool uh, to use as well for things like a ceremony or speeches or first looks. That's so beautiful. <laughs> ready to do this? I'm ready. Are you ready? Yeah, it's just my allergies. <laughs> <laughs> 
Next, the Dark Horse. The Sony, little Sony recorder. It's got a really stupid long name. I could put it here. And then this little sleeve, mic sleeve. Uh, you can put this recorder into a mic sleeve and put it onto either a wired or wireless microphone. But this one's really incredible because you can put it right on the microphone and it's right by their mouth, which tends to be some of the best audio. It's literally just like a voice memo recorder, but it, it really holds up and sounds great. So another really affordable option. Lastly, these kinds of recorders, this is the Zoom H5. Tascam also has the DR. Uh, 40, I believe. And these are amazing because they have XLR inputs. You can go straight out of like a DJ or a band's speaker right into this and uh, get amazing audio. I like to use that uh, with the XLR for one and then another one um, using the onboard microphones in front of another speaker. Getting three options for audio at receptions to get all the speeches and backups on backups on backups. If you're still here and you're watching this, uh, the sponsor of this video, Musicbed, which I'm about to talk about next, is doing a giveaway on my Instagram. So make sure you are following me on Instagram. If you're watching this on the week it is posted, uh, you will be able to take part in that giveaway on Instagram where I'm giving away two of these Sony recorders and two of the Tascam DR10Ls. So make sure you follow me over on Instagram. Music licensing. I've been using Musicbed for the past seven years. It's been my go-to place for all of my music, for all of my wedding films for that amount of time. And it is undoubtedly in my mind, the best resource for music. I pretty much exclusively use them for all of my YouTube videos as well. And it's my one-stop shop for literally everything. Your ability to search any genre or mood is incredible. Their search engine is awesome and their music is just so robust and there's always new stuff coming out, which I love. Now there's a spectrum of music licensing. It goes all the way from like a, a music factory where they're just spitting out music week after week. That's just not that great uh, at a low price. And then you have all the way over to the recording studios with the radio hits and they're just charging obscene amounts of money for for commercial work and, and what you need to use to license and takes forever. Musicbed is right in the middle ground. They're not royalty free, but they are rights managed, which means that whenever you download or use any of their musicians music on their site, the musicians get paid accordingly based on whatever that license is. So if it's a huge commercial work license, they'll get paid more, or if they get more downloads for wedding films, they'll get paid for that as well. So it's awesome to see Musicbed as um, a place that really supports artists, much like us as filmmakers, for musicians and their endeavors as artists. And I just think that's so cool. Their subscription plan is incredible based on uh, if you wanna pay monthly or yearly, you get unlimited access to their subscription music. And so you can download as much music as you'd like. You can use multiple songs, you could use five, 10 songs on a film, whatever you'd like. They have instrumental versions as well as uh, versions with vocals, so you can mix and match those. Um, you're not having to pay for individual licenses. On top of using this for wedding films, if you're interested in getting into the YouTube game, I have friends, uh, Nick Miller and John Bunn, they have a podcast called How to Film Weddings. They do montages of, of first looks and their wedding films go up on their YouTube channels and they've been able to monetize those channels, use Musicbed Music for licensing and rake in a bunch of YouTube ad revenue up in like up to 500 bucks a month in ad revenue because they have music that's licensed um, and it won't get flagged and they're able to monetize it, which is pretty cool and something you could do as well. So if you're interested in Musicbed, you can go to the link in my description or visit their website. And if you sign up for a subscription, you will get one month free if you use the code, all caps, Eric Floberg. Check it out. Using some form of stabilization so that you don't have ridiculously shaky, jittery footage. And there's a handful of ways you can do this uh, with different gear. So I'll just list off a few things that you might wanna look into. One being uh, a monopod. And I really trust a company called Manfrotto with their monopods um, because I use their tripods as well. And the plates that they use are swappable between a monopod and a tripod. And a lot of times I'll use a monopod during a ceremony or during speeches. So I don't have a shaky moving shot, but something that's steady for something that is long form that needs to be filmed. Second, you could use a stabilizer or a gimbal. Uh, companies like Zyun or DJI with their Ronin series make great uh, gimbals for you to use that are compact and small uh, and really versatile, giving you the ability to have really smooth motion throughout your wedding films. I hung on to that kind of style a few years back, but have recently kind of shifted into a more documentary style handheld look that's not like 
crazy shaky and jittery with the hands, but building out a camera that either has a cage like my 1DX Mark II setup that had a cage built around it to spread out my hands uh, and to give kind of that floaty look. Now I shoot on the Canon C200, it's a cinema camera, and it has a top handle and a side handle um, to be able to spread out my hands more. And a lot of times I'll stick that camera like into my body um, and, and pivot in different ways to get that uh, footage to be smooth. A lot of times I will be shooting in 60 frames per second, which allows you to slow down your footage in post. So if you bring it into an editing software like Final Cut or Premiere, you can slow down that 60 frames per second into 24 frames per second, which is the traditional standard cinematic frame rate. You might wanna consider getting a camera that has IBIS, internal body image stabilization, right? Internal body image stabilization. I never remember what it stands for. <laughs> Basically, it's a feature in the camera that allows to synthetically stabilize your footage without having to use a gimbal or anything to stabilize it outside of just holding it. The Panasonic GH5 has really good IBIS. I know the newer Sony mirrorless cameras have good IBIS as well as the new Canon mirrorless R5 and R6 all have um, really comparable and good IBIS so that you might be able to run around handheld with that camera all day if you have that stabilization feature turned on. Finally, the sixth way I like to stabilize footage is using Warp Stabilizer in Premiere Pro when I edit. It's a feature in the effects panel and I like to put it at about five to 10% so that it doesn't distort the image. It makes it look nice and smooth if there's any kind of jittery uh, look in the footage. It helps smooth it out in the post-production. Make sure your footage isn't like shaky Uncle Bob uh, and looks nice and buttery. Figuring out your deliverables. What are you going to send to the client when all is said and done? What are you going to give them as a result of filming? This could be a documentary edit. This could mean a ceremony speech edit. This could mean a montage. There are a multitude of options. And what I started doing when I uh, shot my first wedding in 2011 was I did a full documentary edit. The whole thing was like an hour and 20 minutes long. Is that the most sustainable thing? Not really. That could be something that makes you burn out and made me realize that it wasn't sustainable for doing it for a few years that way. Until I moved to Chicago and some friends in the industry shared that they only do a four to six minute montage for their films that they deliver to clients. And it, it perplexed me. I didn't really understand why people wanted that kind of length. I figured they wanted everything. But the compromise to that was they would deliver a four to six minute montage and raw footage so that the clients could still see everything from the day, just putting all the footage in a timeline and exporting it into one video file so they can just scrub through and see everything from the day. But then having a four to six minute montage that's so easily shareable, fun to watch, can be watched multiple times over and over, shared with friends. The way I put it is you don't have to like make a bowl of popcorn and sit down and have a movie night. So that's how I sell what I do now. But you have to figure out what you want to do and what's sustainable for you. At this point, after doing it for over nine years, I'm able to charge upwards of $8,500 for a four to six minute montage film. Never thought that was possible. Never thought people would want to make that kind of investment in a wedding film. But again, getting to the story and the quality of what you do and getting better and better over time can give you the ability to charge something like that. People seeing the value and wanting to make the investment. So as you see here, I only offer really two packages on a wedding day, the four to six minute montage being in both of them and raw footage being included on the second for an additional $500. I also have a la carte options to have a full edit of the ceremony or a full edit of the speeches, but I usually only sell that like once a year. It's not very popular. The most popular thing is to get the montage and the raw footage. And that's what I want most people to get. Six, the final one, get accustomed to an editing software. If you already use Lightroom or Photoshop as a photographer, you might wanna consider using Premiere Pro. It's within the Adobe suite. Um, while it does have glitches and things that are frustrating, it's what I've used for the past 10 years. And something that could really help you with getting used to something like Premiere Pro is just shooting your everyday life, making vlogs, just shooting all the time and editing little videos to get you familiar with what the software looks like, how to use it and become becoming fluent in it. There are other options as well. You could do Final Cut Pro, which is made by Apple. A lot of people love using that uh, because of how easy it is to use and the interface being smooth as Apple, Apple does. Then you have the Dark Horse DaVinci Resolve, which is actually free unless you wanna to upgrade to the $300 studio version, which has more features, but it is the uncontested champion for coloring your footage and making it look super professional and fancy. 
it's something that I've dabbled in recently and will continue to learn. Those are my six hot, spicy hot tips for you in starting as a wedding filmmaker. Uh, I hope that was helpful for you. Some other resources that might be helpful to you. Like I said, I have a Patreon where I do behind the scenes, uh, editing, all that good stuff, just extra content that's more long form if you are more interested in learning more filmmaking and photography. It's only 10 bucks a month. You can check it down below. Also, make sure you listen to the podcast How to Film Weddings with my friends John Bunn and Nick Miller. It's incredible. They have over 100 episodes at this point, and it's just a phenomenal resource for getting into the game. Don't forget, follow me on Instagram for that giveaway. I will be doing that within the next week, uh, so keep an eye out for stories and posting there. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. If it was helpful for you, make sure to like it. That helps with the little beast called the algorithm. <laughs> uh, subscribe to the channel for content like this and turn on that bell if you want notifications when I post all those fun YouTube things, you know. Thank you so much, YouTube dad out. Make sure to lean in what makes you different. All the, f the phrases, <laughs> see ya.